and also those who are watching online. Uh, so excited for just a, a casual night of worship, excited to be able to uh, just come together tonight and, and again praise the Lord and also look into the Word together. I want to first of all uh, just introduce our guest leader for tonight. Uh, guest leading us will be Justin Mills from the Baptist College of Florida uh, where I graduated from and so we're glad to have him with us and guest leading for us tonight. Um, there. So again, looking forward to our night of worship together. want to first of all have a word of scripture and then I'm going to pray for us and we're going to jump right into it. All right. The scripture reading tonight will be Psalm 134 verses 1 through 3. It says this, a song of ascents. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Let's go in prayer. Father God, we come before you today, and Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. And Father, we come thanking you for how you have blessed us with an opportunity to be here tonight. Father, we thank you for our services this morning, and we thank you for the fact that we were able to praise you and we were able to hear your word. And Lord, we pray that tonight in this place you would remove any and all distractions that would keep us from worshiping you with the fullness of our hearts. Father, help us to focus solely upon who you are and what it is that you want to do in our life tonight. Lord, may your will be done and may you bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, Bellevue. If you would just stand and worship with us tonight as we're going to start with a song entitled Hallelujah for the Cross. This song states how each and every one of us would be hopeless without his goodness, be desperate without his love and a slave to the darkness if he had not went to the cross and paid that price for us. And I would be hopeless without your goodness. And I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross. me down when I was lost and where would I be if it wasn't for the cross oh, hallelujah thank you Jesus I was a prisoner now I'm not with your blood
Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. But with your blood, you bought my freedom. Oh, hallelujah for the cross. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. With your blood. tonight. Just join us in singing the good good old hymn, The Old Rugged Cross.
great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain that I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, and Jesus Christ, my
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just we come before you this evening, Lord, just thanking you. Thanking you for the cross. Thanking you for your sending your son to die such a horrible death so that we have that living hope in you. Because, Lord, we don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a living one. Lord, as Brother Colt comes and brings your word, that pray that we continue to worship as we hear your word. Lord, I pray that we hear you through everything that he says. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, as you're seated tonight, we're going to look into God's word in the book of Zephaniah. So you might have to pull out your table of contents. Um, when I told someone we were doing minor prophets tonight, people kind of raised their eyebrows and looked, but... Uh, as we have been going through uh, some really deep study in Colossians lately, looking at things like Christology and, and the depth of who Christ is and comparing that with the world, it seemed fitting to me that tonight we would look at a minor prophet and talk about worship. Now, so often we get this idea that worship is intimately tied to the New Testament, and I don't, I don't really know where that comes from. Some of the greatest texts that deal with worship are found in the Psalms, they're found in uh, many of these uh, minor prophet sections, we see these great discourses on what worship is and why we worship and why we're here in a, a church to worship. And so as we think about this tonight, I, I want you to think about it in the lens here, not so much of what Christ has done, but when we think about Zephaniah, we're thinking about, he was looking at it as what Christ would do. Now for us, we're thinking about it again, what Christ has done, but Zephaniah is simply looking forward to what Christ would do. We see this tonight. This is the very end of the book of Zephaniah. And so we will look at it together. I will read the verses from the English Standard Version. You follow along in your translation, and we'll jump right into it. Beginning in verse 14, it says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, and let not your, heart, your hands rather, grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. That time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praise among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Let's go in prayer. Father God, once again we come before you tonight, and Lord, as we look into your word, we recognize that, Father, you have given your word so that we may know more of who you are and, Father, how we may serve you. So, Lord, we pray tonight as we approach this text, as we look into your word, you would convict us where we need it, you would strengthen us where we need it, you would equip us for the task ahead of, it, ahead of us as we need it. Father, you would move me out of the way tonight and use me as a mouthpiece to proclaim your message to your people. Lord, help us to focus solely upon your word and what it says, and, Father, where we fall short of what it tells us to do. Father, may we change by your grace and your mercy, to be more in line with your will. Father, we ask that you would bless this time together in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. In order to give you a little context, because I'm sure that most of us aren't intimately familiar with the history and the background of what's going on in Zephaniah, like we might be in some other places, I want to just tell you a little bit about what's happening here. Zephaniah is preaching during the time right before King Josiah initiates reforms in the Old Testament. Now, if you're not familiar with the kings, what happened is there was a period of really dark times in, in um, the days of ancient Israel. And what's happening here is particularly there has been a lot of pagan idol worship. For instance, Asherah poles have been lifted up in places. They worshiped a goddess Asherah there. We see in other places where they're worshiping Baal and so on and so forth. And during that time, what began to happen is eventually, when King Josiah was there, they found the book of the law and they began to look at it and recognize, hey, we need to be doing what God said that we should do. And so as King Josiah begins to initiate some reforms during that time, Zephaniah is going around preaching. 
And we know from the the dates and the context that we see here that this is about the same time that Jeremiah starts preaching, a major prophet who you might be a little more familiar with. And so in the beginning of his book, what happens is that Zephaniah gives a message of universal judgment. He says, judgment is coming. He warns them that, that basically there is no hope. This is an oracle, as it's called, of judgment, a prophecy. And so what Zephaniah does, he continues to tell them, judgment is coming, judgment is coming, there's nothing you can do. Judgment is coming. And then he uses his terminology of the Old Testament and refers to the day of the Lord. He says, it will come and judgment will be complete. And we look at that and we say, man, Zephaniah starts off in a real nice place. But what Zephaniah does throughout this book is he begins to teach them that God is not far away. He's not unconcerned with what's going on, but rather God is present and intimately evolved with the things that were going on amongst humanity and in mankind. And so after proclaiming the judgment, what Zephaniah begins to do is he shows that God cares about humanity. He offers a a calling to repent. And then he gives a promise that God would judge the wicked and save a remnant. And we see this in the verses immediately preceding those we saw tonight. I'll read them for you again. That's Zephaniah 3, and we'll look at verses 12 through 13 here really quickly. He says, I will leave in your midst a people, humble and lowly, They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel, and they shall do no injustice and speak no lies. Nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. In this passage, Zephaniah is explaining that that God would save a remnant, just as he would judge the wicked in justness and righteousness. He would save by graciousness and mercy. And so in response to that promise of a lowly and humble people who would praise him and trust in his name, Zephaniah explains a correct, worshipful response. And through that tonight in our text, I want you to just see three things that worship is. This might seem very elementary, but I just want to remind you tonight of three things that worship is. Number one is this, worship includes that concept of singing and praising. It includes here several Uh, terms that refer to this concept of praise or singing or or vocalization. For instance, the first word we see here is that word singing. It's the very first thing we see here in verse 14. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Well, when we think about this, we begin to break it down in Hebrew. It, It looks as this, and it says it is a ringing cry. Now, we have all been in singing before. Some people's voices ring a little more than others, right? Some of us are more confident than others. But the idea, guys, is that we are to sing. Now, we recognize that singing usually is something that we go to uh, at various points in our life. For instance, singing isn't just tied to one emotion, but rather it's tied to a lot of different ones. Uh, Maybe you've been sad and you listen to a sad song, right? And you sing along with it in the car. Maybe you've been happy and so you're singing in the shower. I don't know, but my point is, is there's all kinds of emotions in there. And every emotion deals with singing. Equally so, every emotion that we deal with should bring praise to God. Everything that we're doing should cause us to sing before God. We should sing out his praises and who he is because of his greatness. Singing makes sense. We get that. Well, what's the second one we see here? We see that term, that verb, to shout. Now, we're thinking this must be that we just need to start screaming amen. That's what he's doing. He's looking for compliments or affirmation or something like that. But that's not what he's talking about. This is not the shout that we have of, uh, of simply yelling something. But rather, this is a, a specific Hebrew word, which is ruah. And in what it means is a war cry. But not just any war cry. It's a cry of triumph. This is the idea of the army that has won victory, and, and as the enemy is totally and completely defeated... They start jumping up and down and cheering. That is the language that we see here. It's a triumphal shout when the battle has won. I um, have had this happen before. For instance, many of us would get to this point during a football game. I'll tell a story about that in a minute. But we'll we'll, we'll get to this point where we, we have this kind of joy over things like that. 
a football team, a, a, a little bit of happiness thing that comes along. Something good happens to us and we're more apt to shout. But how rarely do we shout for joy and victory in knowing that our battle has been won? You see, the Bible tells us it is finished. He's done it. It's complete. So we should shout the victory, as the old hymn says. Next, we see here that it says to rejoice and exult with all your heart. And I kind of want to combine these two here because in the Hebrew language, they're intimately combined. And what this is telling is here rejoicing and, and exulting. We definitely don't use exult a lot. We might deal with rejoicing. We recognize that again as to be happy and to, to have this expression of happiness. But exulting is the physical response, and it is literally jumping for joy. Now, I told you a football story. When I uh, was watching a big rivalry football game, and one of the teams made a very big play that has been on in history forever and ever, I may or may not have jumped so high that I cut my hand on the roof. I was jumping for joy. Now, that is the language that we see here we're called to respond with in terms of who God is and what he's done for us. It should be such a, a, a jubilance and a happiness that it's, it's clear to everyone around us. It's exciting. They're, we're jumping it for joy. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that I want you to just be hopping everywhere you go, but we should have our happiness and our joy in the Lord on full display to those around us. I think about this in terms of here, it's, it says we're to, be done, we're to do this with all of our heart. We're, we're to be happy and joyful and to show that happiness and joy with all of our heart. Now we recognize this doesn't mean we live in, in some jaded reality looking at things through rose-colored glasses. We're not out here to just say that everything is always perfect and wonderful and peachy. But what we are to do is to take every circumstance and everything that comes our way, knowing that our joy comes not from those circumstances, but from God and what he has done for us. You see, for Christians, we should be like Pavlov's dog. Y'all ever heard of Pavlov's dog? Psychological uh, experiment where uh, Pavlov has his dog and he rings a bell every time he feeds him. Every time the dog is fed, the bell is rung. And so eventually, Pavlov rings the bell and he doesn't put food down and the dog's wondering... Where's the beef? Right? He's salivating. He's, he's ready to eat. He's ready to go. He was conditioned so that every time he heard that bell, he expected that he was going to eat. Now, I share this with you to say this. We should be, as Christians, so conditioned by God's faithfulness that every time we're in a problem, every time we hear his name, we respond with joy and trust. Because, in fact, if you look throughout all of Scripture, everywhere God has been faithful. Every time. He's always acted according to his will. He's, he's acting in grace. He's acting in holiness and justness. He can be counted on. And so for us, again, we should be so conditioned that every time we hear God's name, every time we think of what he has done, we respond with joy, with happiness, with singing, with shouting, recognizing that he has won the victory. The Bible tells us to be prepared when people ask us why we have hope. What's the difference in someone who has hope and someone who doesn't when you see them? Right? I think about this. People who I see who have hope, and in the ministry, you see people in a lot of circumstances and situations. And and when you go to someone who maybe, for instance, I have this one person in my mind who, as he was passing away, he knew it was coming. But I could tell he had hope by the joy he exhibited. By the same token, I've been around people who had no hope, and I could tell it by the lack of joy that they exhibited. Guys, all I want you to see here is this. We should be prepared. Whenever people look at us, first of all, we should live a life that would cause people to ask, why do you have that hope that you have? And secondly, we should be prepared to tell them that it is from God who has delivered us. God who has saved us by his grace and by his mercy. And so tonight and every time we worship, may we sing, may we declare his victory, may we be happy and filled with joy. May we do it with all of our heart and share it with others. Because guys, just as that happiness is there, it is a public proclamation that we have a reason to be happy. If we go out into the world all miserable all the time, then people will wonder, why are they doing this? 
See, we have to remember our joy comes from God and his deliverance and his truth. Secondly, tonight, I want you to see that worship not only includes singing and praising, but it requires trusting God and fearing not. Now, in this section, we we see so much of what God does. Worship requires us to trust God. You see, we can't praise someone who we don't believe is doing what he says he's going to do. We're not going to be joyful if we don't believe that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. And so as we look at this passage, what's so amazing to me is that Zephaniah keys in on something that so many of us miss, and that is that he he focuses on what God does. Notice what he says here of what God has done. He has taken away the judgments, cleared away the enemies. He will rejoice. Notice what it says he will do. He will rejoice. He will quiet you. He will exult. He will gather those of you who mourn. So you'll no longer suffer reproach. He will deal with all the oppressors. He will save the lame and gather the outcasts. He'll change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. He says, I will bring you in at the time when I gather you together. I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth. I will restore your fortunes before your eyes. You see, when we're worshiping God in our life, It's not just about singing the songs or the praises, but rather here tonight we see that it's about recognizing what God has done and trusting him in what he says. As we look at these I will statements, as we look at what God has done, we must recognize that he is in control. He has a plan. And notice that the way that we respond to God's plan, the way we respond to his sovereignty, the way we respond to his grace and mercy is by rightly and worshipfully trusting him and fearing not. You see, when we trust God and we don't fear, we are worshiping because worship at its core is a response to God in anything we do. It's a response to God. Whether it's how we respond when something bad happens to us, it's an act of worship. Because we recognize that God, being in control of everything, there's things going on. And so when we respond to circumstances, we respond to what's happening, we're demonstrating our worship. Twice here it says, do not fear. And and one of those times, it's, it's incredibly specific. It says, never again fear evil. Man, never again fear evil. Why? Notice what it says. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. We'll look at Zephaniah's contemporary here for a moment. Jeremiah 20, 11. I'm just going to read it to you. It says this. It says, But the Lord is with me as a dread champion. Therefore my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. I love that language. God is a dread champion. Now, do y'all know what a dread champion is? That's somebody who, when you come up against them, you dread it. Why? Because defeat is sure. You know you're going to lose before you even walk in there. This is our God is with us as a dread champion. The Bible describes it this way. God is with us. Who can be against us? The Bible says it this way, nothing can separate us. The Bible teaches us that nothing can happen to us that God does not allow, that he makes all things work together for the good of those who trust him. In all of these situations, all of these promises, all of these things we see, we are required to trust God and by virtue of trusting him, not fear, not be afraid. And so guys, we respond in worship when we trust him and when we don't fear regardless of the circumstances regardless of what's going on around us. So we see that worship is, definitely includes singing and praising. It definitely requires trusting him and fearing not. But number three, we see that worship includes working for the kingdom. It says here in verse 16, let not your hands grow weak. The language here is that of a, a drooping posture. Um, the way I think about this is, to me, one of the saddest things in the world is watching the Little League World Series, and you're watching the final game, and one of the teams loses. Breaks my heart. Why? Because all those kids who lost 
are just the most bummed out people in the world. Their little heads are hanging down and their arms are, are drooping and they're just sad and you can look at their posture and you can see that these little kids are just like crushed. That is the language that's said here. Don't be that way. D don't let your head hang down and your shoulders slouch and your, your hands be drooping. Our hands shouldn't slouch. Our heads should be held high, not because of ourselves and because we've done anything, but because of our king. You see, when we trust him and when we don't fear evil, we quit focusing on the things of the world and start focusing on the things of God. You see, we don't quit working. We don't let our hands grow weak because we recognize that when we're working for God, work is worship. In our Colossians study, we, we're going to see everything we do is to be done for the glory of God. Every single thing. The Bible is essentially teaching us through that, that no matter what you're good at, do it for the glory of God. I, I, I'm quick to tell people that the best evangelistic strategy is for you to do whatever you're good at to the glory of God and to make friends in doing it. Seriously. Some of the best evangelists I know are beekeepers, and they're really good ones. And they make friends with other beekeepers who are lost, and they share the gospel with them. The same with woodworking or gardening or anything else that you do. Whatever we're doing, we should do it to the glory of God, and we should not grow weary of doing good. We work hard in all that we do so that we will see his kingdom grow. And, and Romans tells us that this is worship. Romans 12.1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You see, guys, when we work for the kingdom, we are worshiping. Thus, we should do it with all of our might. When we're here, whether, it is, whether we're greeting, whether we're cleaning the toilet, whenever we do anything in, for the kingdom of God, we must take it as an act of worship, doing it to the best of our ability for the glory of God. And so tonight as our worship team comes back up here, I, I just want to tell you we work for that reason, those verses 17 through 20. The things that God has done, the things that God will do, and because he is with us. As recognizing that what Zephaniah was talking about here, the restoration of fortune, the removal of judgment, all of that was because there was one coming who would deliver us from the price, or for the penalty of our sins. One who would bear God's wrath on the cross, live a sinless life, showed his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. As may we throw ourselves on his mercy, may we put him as the head of our life, and may we praise him for his grace. Let's go in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. Father, we thank you for the fact that you have taken away judgment of those who put their hope and their trust in you. Father, we thank you that you were not slack concerning your promise, but that in everything you have been faithful. And so, Lord, tonight, if we are looking for a reason to praise, if we're looking for a reason to trust and to not be afraid, and, Father, if we're looking for a reason to keep going and not quit, Lord, may we find that all of those things, the reason is you, your faithfulness, your love, your grace, and, Father, your holiness. Lord, may your will be done in this place tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God, I look to you, and I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, and you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom to know just what. And I will love you all my strength. And I will. Have a word of scripture and we'll be dismissed with prayer tonight. Psalm 121 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time, forth and forevermore. Amen. Let's go in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time together tonight, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. And Lord, we pray that through this time together tonight, Lord, we would be reminded of just who you are. And Father, just what you've called us to do in worshiping you. So, Father, as we depart tonight, may we do so worshiping you with the fullness of who we are so that the world will look upon us and ask, who is it you're worshiping and why are you worshiping him? And may we be ready to give that answer as you give the opportunities. Father, we pray that you would lead God and direct us and bring us back together at the next appointed time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.